Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the June edition of the Coffee Microcaps Microcap Fund Manager Monthly Interview. And I am delighted to say we're joined by Mitchell Atkins from Magnolia Capital. Mitchell, how are you going? Good, thanks. Great to be here. Cheers. Thanks for coming on and joining us. For anybody who's not familiar with Magnolia Capital, um, do you want to just give us a, a quick overview of uh, Magnolia Capital? Yeah, so we're an investment manager that's been around since 2015. Um, today, about 80% of our business has been fixed income um, lending, um, and the other 20% is equities. So micro caps are our main focus, and we have a very small, large cap portfolio. Um, but we've been running our micro cap portfolio under the fund structure for just over a year now, where previously we've done it on a deal by deal basis. So um, it's been great so far. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, for viewers, uh... We've included now um, Magnolia Capital's microcap fund into our quarterly fund manager review. Um, the June one will be coming out uh, probably mid to late July. So if you want to catch all the update performance numbers, have a look at that. Uh, so we're going to jump straight into the two stocks. Uh, the first one, Mitchell, you wanted to chat about is um, wide open agriculture. So for people who don't know, um, how do these guys make their money? Yeah, awesome. So it's a super interesting space. They uh, make their money on fast growing like um, food and beverage alternatives. So um, they've developed a lupin based protein that's being used to create food and drink products in a large um, growing market. It's got a potential consumer product development across five foods and beverage categories, including plant, um, plant based meat, non dairy milk alternatives, noodles, plant based, and protein supplements. So, really, as I see it, the next wave of um, food. Okay, great. And is it the the whole Lupin angle, you know, the main investment thesis for you guys? Because I know, you know, we've got Impossible Foods and Beyond Meats and, you know, Almond Milk and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's kind of a lot of kind of people in that space um, kind of internationally and, and maybe not as much in, in Australia, but is it the, the kind of Lupin bedrock? Is that the kind of interesting angle for you guys? Yeah, it's a niche. Um, it's not really, it hasn't really been knocked out of the park yet, especially in the Australian market. So I think the key management um, or the management behind WIA are, are great and they've got the experience to take us to the next um, level. And especially around the timing too, I think being that uh, one of the first, in my, my opinions, um, to the market, um, will give them that, like I said, competitive advantage, especially why it's hot at the moment. Yeah. And then in terms of, I guess, you know, a lot of these uh, consumer products businesses, you know what, I guess the, some of the key risks are, you know, you've got the, the product development phase, now, uh, which I think you can, you know, kind of uh, wide open agriculture are in now, but, you know, the, the phase everybody forgets about is, you know, mm -hmm. distribution and, you know, getting it onto shelves. So like, uh, and getting shelf space within the, in the big retailers, you know, is always, always a challenge because they've got, you know, solid sales history of the product that's there. And you're saying, no, no, I'll put ours on and, and, you know, take this one off the shelf. So is, is that one of the kind of the, the key risks for you is like, you know, getting that distribution, getting the product in front of people? Yeah. So that's the application for the Lupin technology. It's really that brand acceptance um, and competitive. Yeah. I mean, getting that competitive advantage. And as you can see, like the alternative food markets or markets as a whole, for especially the next generation, um, because in my generation, it's really making sure that the branding is right um, because it can quickly go, we can go from hero to zero overnight um, based on the way you promote your product or the guys you hang around with or um, your distribution networks. So that's going to be um, very key for WA and I think it's one of the biggest risks um, for the company. But so far, so good. Yeah, because they're, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're kind of up and running with kind of sales of their um uh, milk base or milk alternative product in wa and, and the plan is to take that over east is that where they're at currently or yeah this is taking the east of um essentially put a lot of their eggs in this in technology basket and, and the next quarter is going to be key um so that yeah the milk and bringing across the east coast is has been up is a challenge and i think it will continue to be a challenge Okay, so yeah, you, you mentioned the next quarter there. I mean, there are Appendix Four C reporting, so we should be, you know, getting uh, getting an update from them the kind of back end of July, uh, and then we'll obviously get the annual reports and stuff at uh, the, the back end of August. So, what are you kind of looking for? You know, Appendix Four C 
you know, annual report uh, coming out uh, August, September, you know, what kind of some of the key things to be that people should be looking out for when they're looking at um, uh, wide open agriculture at this stage? Well, it's the same thing as most um, cash flow negative for um, emerging companies, especially in the R&D phase. It's just watching that cash burn. Uh, last quarter, I believe they, in my opinion, beat estimates. So they're um, definitely improved. Um, so making sure, obviously, they're managing that, that cash balance and the R and D, and making sure the revenue numbers are there. Um, I know that there was a little, there was a delay with one of the um, revenue drivers, and that pushed it into this quarter. So really going to see how that goes, um, yeah, how much cash they've got, and as most micro caps is the last thing most of the investors want is a um, a dollar of capital to raise unless they really need to. Um, so just seeing how they're going to address that. And I know they've kind of got a three pronged pronged approach. Um, you know, they're doing online direct to consumer, they're doing, you know, wholesale through the retailers and they're, you know, doing the cafes and the, that kind of food service um, uh, market. Are you worried about where the revenue comes from? Um, you know, because they all have like kind of different margins and, and, and different size markets, or is it just a case of, you know, they got to be proving now, you know, revenue growth quarter on quarter and, and ideally, um, you know, that ramping up as, as sales uh, start getting a bit of traction over East. Yeah, so I think the best, the way they're approaching it by hitting um, majority of the markets and a few different channels is the best so far. Uh, really looking to see, as you, as you said, the margins um, and the take up rate across the three, three channels. To me, then once they've done that, to sit back and figure out what's the cost benefit and time benefit of each. Obviously, going into your supermarket chains and really getting that mass production is great for generating quantity of sales, but it's always not the um, most profitable. And then you can be held to the account of one um, network rather than multiple. So I like the way they're hitting the, the smaller guys and also direct. So that way you're not, well, they're not so um, reliant on the big supermarket chain. So to me, hopefully they, they really nail the, the wholesale line and then the direct to consumer um, takes off as well. Yeah, I mean the whole the wholesale line is good for, I guess, unit economics and 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 you know getting you that kind of scale benefits and <coughs> economies of scale, which you know if you can leverage some high margin sales into the other channels, um, you know the whole mix can kind of work in work in tandem. Uh, let's move on to your second one. We're uh, definitely completely switching gears here from uh, yeah. food and beverage to high high. I think it's fair to say a high, high tech um, business. Uh, MicroX, I actually looked up before we came on, when did they IPO? Was, I was trying to remember, I thought it was kind of 17 or 18, but it was actually the back end of 15. So yeah. a business has been around for a while, um, but uh, I think probably a lot of people, you know, wouldn't know how they operate, make their money. So maybe just give us an overview of, you know, what MicroX actually does. Yeah, yeah. So to keep it super simple, they essentially make a, an X-ray machine that's um, 95 kilos compared to the industry standard of four to 500 kilos. Um, so very, very lightweight, very high tech and can be distributed very, very quickly. And it all comes down to the, the carbon nanotube emitter technology, which it, uh, you need to build a, a rocket ship to understand. But to me, that they've got, and my understanding of it is it, cutting edge. Yes, they've been a, around for a while. Um, which brings it down to the biggest challenge for these um, the company going forward. So a really good underlying tech, innovative product being a lot lighter and easy to move. Um, it can pretty much be dropped anywhere as well, like into war zones or flood zones or wherever it needs to be given the, given the way. Um, they've got like a good growing portfolio of products, um, but the issues as I see so far is delay so far is really delaying to commercialization. It's a competitive product so they're out there in the market, same as, same as WA. So they're out there in the market. Um, they've been around getting out there, but this really comes down to who's going to be their biggest supplier, getting that government support and the contracts can be critical. Um, but I believe they've got the underlying product that can get them there. Yeah. And I mean, is that the kind of key investment thesis? Um, just the, I guess, broad range of, environments that their their tech can operate i mean anybody who's had an x-ray you know they'll be familiar with it as you say a three four hundred kilo siemens or, or or ge healthcare machine that you know you you wouldn't you wouldn't move or or um set up easily anywhere 
Um, is that the key, or is it the combination of the of the of the carbon nanotube technology? As far as I know, X-ray machines kind of more operate on a. Um, I think it's more kind of a legacy 1970s tech. I think when X-rays first came around, and it hasn't really it hasn't really changed since then, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So yeah, that. But it can also be so a few other things. What I do like about it is it's proof of 40 different countries worldwide. So it doesn't have to be the Australian market. We can put into more developing and emerging companies. They're already into 14 of those 40 already. So while we're, we're, we're very lucky here in Australia that we have the best of the best. So um, unfortunately, emerging companies aren't as lucky and as fortunate as we are. So having that approval and then really getting out there. Plus, it can be there's a large end market application. So it can be used for military. It can use at, at, um, at airports, for example, um, with that same technology. So their products aren't just limited to the X-ray machine. Okay. Um, and I guess, yeah, I think you kind of alluded to it in your opening remarks, uh, a bit like any business, everything takes twice as long and, and costs twice as much uh, as, you, as the budget says. Um, I mean, is that the key risk is, you know, the, it's another kind of maybe false dawn for them that, you know, they've been around for five years and, you know, they've now nailed down the, the R&D and the, they've got a few regulatory approvals and you know the commercialization phase just kind of takes again longer than kind of most key people expected um is that kind of the key risk the, the commercialization phase of it now you know yeah sounds like the tech yeah, so is kind of well proven and you know they're, they're getting the regulatory approvals and i usually find you know if tga signs off it you know ce isn't far behind and fda isn't far behind or vice versa to get fda first C and TGA and all these other ones kind of, you know, fall into place uh, not, not long after. Yeah, I think it's a combination of um, what we see, a few things like it, sometimes micro caps get a bit stale that have been around for a while. So they've got that, that is using investor base. Obviously there's 1500 odd micro caps out there. They're not covered by too limited instos. And there's a, it is an emerging space in terms of the fund managers, but your retails, they, they may have been in this yeah, since 2015 and, or even earlier, like, and they're, pre-IPO, et cetera, they kind of lose the taste and the drive for the product. They've lost confidence in management just by taking so long. So I think this is a combination of both. It's the turning around of the existing investor base, um, getting some new guys on board and really that believe in the product um, and supporting the business into its next phase of growth, which admittedly it should have hit earlier. But unfortunately, when you're developing a product, it always takes longer than expected. If it was easy, we'd all be doing it. So. Um, to answer your question, I think they're on the verge and it's just been stale yeah. by the length of time it's taken and it just needs to roll those investors. Yeah, momentum can be, a, you know, a, a, a serious uh, force, in uh, especially in microcaps, uh, as I well know. I mean, they raised a big quack of cash. I can't remember, was it with the start of this year or the back end of last year? Um, yeah. So they're pretty well, they're, they're pretty well funded now. You know, I, I, again, another Appendix 4C based business, you know, be reporting the back end of July. So, I mean, to an extent, cash burn, I don't think is, you know, something we really need no. to watch out for. I mean, is the key thing you're looking, you know, we'll take the Appendix 4C and let's go out to the end of kind of calendar 21. Is the key thing you're watching out for now that, you know, we just got to see announcements of decent sized, you know, sales contracts coming through. Is, 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 it, is it kind of that simple, I guess, for, the, for yeah. Micro X? Yeah, if I was sitting down in front of management, I'd be asking how quickly are they going to expand into the US? What are their plans? And what, how are they going to win some contracts to really get this product out there? Yeah. To me, that's the two main things. If they can do that, yeah. they're home. Yeah. But cash is definitely not an issue at this stage. Yeah, because I think they said they're funded now for the next 18 months or 24 months at least. And that's excluding, I guess, um, you know, revenue coming in from some of these sales contracts. So, yeah, I think, as you say, you know, what can management deliver on the sales front over the balance of 2021 and beyond? I think that's kind of the key thing to, to look out for, um, uh, for, for Micro X at least. Uh, it's not a small exactly. market cap either, 150 million. I mean, it's a decent, it's a decent size micro cap as well. Um, so yeah, it looks yeah, and as you say, I think a bit under the radar, and it just needs to get a get a bit of momentum going, perhaps. Exactly, and a bit just something to watch is like obviously when micros or management teams have a lot of capital, we just need to watch. Maybe not now, but see how they if they become into compliance. 
and just really sitting on their hands. But I don't think that would be the case with um, the management team with MicroX, but that's definitely a, a red flag to watch out for. Okay, great. Mitchell, thank you very much for uh, giving us the overview of those two. Uh, I'll just mention on um, Wide Open Agriculture, um, Ben called the CEO actually presented, uh, I think it was about two or three months ago at our Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. I'll link to, back to that video in the show notes so people who want to watch Ben's presentation and get kind of a, a broader overview uh, uh, of um, the Wide Open Agriculture story. Um, we only had kind of 10 minutes to kind of touch on it on it briefly um, and Mitchell if anybody wants to find out more about Magnolia Capital and the fund um, what's the best way to get in touch? The easiest way is just to jump on the website magnoliacapital.com.au and um, simply reach out okay good all the contact details are there what our investment team and myself and just for people are you wholesale only or open to retail or at this stage we're wholesale only okay so and retail as yeah and the minimum for the wholesale uh, sophisticated investors? It's 150K investment minimum. 150K. Okay, great. Okay, Mitchell, thank you very much. And um, I will hopefully chat to you again sometime in the future. Perfect, thank you.